Good morning and welcome to the sixth meeting in 2019 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Um, the usual story when we mobile phones, please make sure they're not in a process that will interfere with proceedings. Uh, the first item on the agenda this morning is to take evidence on a roundtable format. Today's roundtable will focus on Scottish VAT assignment and we will take evidence from Mark Taylor, who's the Assistant Director at Audit Scotland, Charlotte Barber, who's the Director of Taxation at ICAS, John Cullinan, who is a Tax Policy Director at Chartered Institute of Taxation, Professor Graeme Roy, Director of Fraser Flanders Institute, John Ireland, the Chief Executive of the Scottish Fiscal Commission, and Dr Paul Matthews, who's a Senior Analyst at the Office of Budget Responsibility. Can I warmly welcome all our witnesses this morning to say, and also to say I'm very grateful for you coming along to the, this morning to help us with this task, which is, on the, on the face of it, uh, technical, but when you start digging under a bit, it's quite a complicated area, so I'm sure you're going to be able to help us significantly as part of our discussions this morning. It's intended that this discussion will be as free-flowing as we can make it. We have um, structured it around a, a, a three themes, um, so if you want to contribute, just catch my eye or indeed Jim's eye, and we'll make sure you can get in. Um, to say your piece, we need everybody to contribute as successfully as possible. The theory is will be around how VAT can be assigned to Scotland effectively, uh, the robustness and transparency of VAT assignment methodology, and issues around for VAT forecasting and risk to the Scottish budget. Now, it's inevitable we're going to give it a flow across these areas. So, if, if I feel one area is already exhausted as we go through this, then we'll just move on to the next. All that being said, um, the, firstly we will consider the theme on how VT can be assigned effectively to Scotland and I invite Willie Coffey, MSP, to start that discussion. Thank you, Willie. Thanks very much, Bruce. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we know that the first 10p of the standard rate and the first 2.5p of the reduced rate are to be assigned to Scotland using a fairly simple estimation of the total VAT take across the UK. Just a couple of questions just to hopefully start us off. Could the assignment of VAT to Scotland be done more effectively or even more accurately? How much of an influence do you think it could have on policy development by the Scottish Government? And if the VAT receipts fluctuate, is it fair to hold the Scottish Government to account when we have no levers to influence any of it? Right, so start for 10. Who'd like to kick off that very simple question? Henry? <laughs> <laughs> Graham, thank you very much. Excellent. I was um, going to break it down a bit if I needed to, but yeah. Graham, go okay. for it. So there's a couple of things in there. I think, firstly, one of the big challenges we know with assigning VAT is being able to come up with a robust estimate. And um, the papers that have been published so far set out one way of doing it. And you're right, it's a relatively simplistic way you do it by basing it on you know, essentially our share of consumption across the UK. The challenge with that is that um, even if you do that, the potential for variability within these estimates is, is significant. So if you look at the JERS numbers, you're talking about it being plus or minus a couple hundred million either side, um, just based on statistical uncertainty that, that goes into that. So there's a, there's a big question there about the accuracy or ability to get a pinpoint accurate estimate of VAT mm. revenues in Scotland. And that, that comes back to, I guess, a couple of things. One is the complexity of the VAT system. So it's much more complex than income tax. And secondly, it's much more complex to estimate VAT revenues just given the fact that you're having to worry about what people are spending on a day-to-day -day basis across a wide variety of products which therefore means that you can't have the same level of certainty or the same accuracy of estimation you could do with something like income tax. So I think there's a, a big issue there about the accuracy. And I guess there's a question for Parliament to think about taking on, you know, the level of risk it wants to take on, given that level of uncertainty that exists purely from a statistical point of view. So irrespective of whether you think there's volatility in the economy, but purely in that statistical point, there's a level of risk there. And I think your second question more generally around the ability to the ability to be accountable for VAT revenues or to grow re VAT revenues. Um, the principle behind, I guess, assigning VAT was because it is correlated with the strength of your economy and therefore when the economy does well, you gain the benefits from doing that. When your economy 
uh, does worse and you're accountable for that happening. I guess there's two questions. One is about the overall ability of the levers that the Scottish Government have to control the economy. But then secondly, the levers it has to control changes in VT revenues specifically. So do we have any levers that can say we can try and encourage people to spend more on certain types of products that are vatable? And do you want to do that? Do you want to try and encourage people to spend more? Um, rather than save less? Is that the types of things you want to do? So I think there's a whole host of different issues in there about the ability to use your levers in a way to try and move VAT revenues. And as I said, that then, likes, that then links back into the complexity of how you estimate it. Okay. I'm Charlotte? I, I might add to that that ICAS has said from the outset that you need to be careful about the the, the flow-on consequences as to whether it would then lend itself to the Scottish Government looking towards uh, the kind of industries that, that ha you know, generate VAT. Food industry tends to be zero-rated, so you might not go there. Th there are those kind of issues, but I'm not sure that the correlation is that strong between your individual policies and this VAT assignment model. I'd have thought it's much more broad and it's just the general strength of the economy, assuming the economy equals spending. Might not. John. Uh, thank you. Um, I mean, I would have thought there's kind of two aspects to it. One is, if you like, the um, fluctuations and the volatility that are due to the policy intention. Uh, so, um, if there is more VAT receipts, it, uh, let's ignore the estimating problem for a moment. But if there are more VAT re receipts in Scotland due to the strength of the Scottish economy. That's the kind of intended part. That's a, that's something you would get if you had a fully devolved tax. Um, so you know whether it's fair or not is one thing, but it's kind of, I guess it's more of a political you know uh, decision. Is that what you know what you want to happen? And, and as far as um, as far as that is concerned, I mean w w one thing I haven't seen anything about, and I think Charlotte just alluded to it, is uh, the sort of distributional side of things. So uh, there's a point made in discussion of Scottish income tax about the progressivity of the system. You know, generally speaking, the belief is that uh, if um, incomes are more evenly spread, there'll be more consumption. You know, on the other hand, maybe some of that consumption is in things like food that are, you know, zero rated for VAT. And I, I don't think I've seen, you know, an awful lot of analysis as to uh, how those, policy, those policies might fit together. So, uh, you know, yes, if policies are adopted that boost the Scottish economy and therefore spending in a general sense, you would generally expect to get more VAT receipts. But I haven't seen much analysis of it broken down distributionally or, or otherwise. But then the other side of it is the the other side of the whole thing is, if you like, the unintended volatility, which goes down to the fact that we're having to use a lot of estimates. And I, I, I mean, rather simplistically, I tend to have the feeling that actually it doesn't matter so much if it's inaccurate on day one, if it then remains constantly inaccurate in the same way. Uh, because, you know, uh, you've, you've given up the same amount of block grants and nothing changes so what does it you know one from one point of view what does it matter but uh, I, I mean to be honest this is not a kind of tax specialist area this is a statistical uh, issue and I, I didn't see much in the official papers about the volatility of those estimates but some of the comments about them seem to suggest that it could be quite volatile indeed so I think that you know I get the impression that is an area of risk you know for the, for the Scottish Parliament. Thank you John. Mark? Yeah, as, as the committee well knows, knows and has spoken about on a number of occasions, of course, what matters ultimately is the interaction between the UK tax take and the Scottish tax take, however assessed. And there's something about, from a policy perspective, how do those UK policies play in Scotland and how can Scottish governments and parliaments match or, or divert? divert from uh, what the policy perspective is at a UK level and it's the, the um, interaction of those two. Now clearly there's no ability to vary tax rates or to vary the tax model but there's, there's other things uh, that the, 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 the uh, governments can do around encouraging economic growth. What there is is, is a kind of step removed from that to consumption and how that flows through to the VAT model. Just to reiterate, and, and I know we'll come back to it, around the estimation uh, uh, process, this is essentially something new that's brought into how the fiscal framework operates. There's been small degrees of it elsewhere, but essentially this whole adjustment is based ultimately on an estimate. And that is fundamentally different from what the position was before. And that raises questions which I know we want to get into about uh, people's... Uh, 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 
trust of that estimate process and, 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 and ability of all parties to be able to rely on something that they know is an estimate. Uh, the last thing to say is just really to emphasise that point about if it's consistently wrong, that's less of an issue. But it's knowing that it's consistently wrong is, is the challenge and uh, the extent to which the volatility sits on both sides of the equation, the block grant adjustment and in the tax take in Scotland, uh, and how much is that driven just simply to, to pick up on Professor Roy's point about the, the statistical estimation process and to the extent to which those two uh, pieces of volatility are correlated or cancel each other out or potentially build on one another. And because the tax calculation basically works out what the UK position is, works out what the Scottish position is, and takes away the Scottish position from the UK position. There's a danger of that amplification in this process more so than elsewhere. And John, uh, given that the SFC are in a situation where you're going to have to forecast on the back of estimates, if I've got that right, in terms of the, for, the, for the future and the way this works, how concerned should we be in these circumstances if actually that we'll never have any real outturn figures from a Scottish perspective on VAT? I think, <clears throat> I think there are two, two dimensions to that question. I think there's first a question which is not for the Commission, which is in a sense the political acceptability of that, um, and people's trust in the assignment data and model. Um, we can talk about some of the technical aspects of that later. But So I think there's that political thing, but I think from our perspective as a Commission, it, it's more of a grey continuum. So the difficulty that the, the assignment process assigns for us in forecasting is that there, you can imagine that you have this underlying VAT revenue for Scotland. That's the sort of conceptual thing you're trying to, to, un, un, to work with. But because you have a statistical model in its estimation, um, you introduce noise. And that noise is, is hopefully random, but perhaps not random. So it moves around. And the job of the Commission will be not just to sort of estimate that underlying trend, but it will be to estimate or forecast what that random error is in the assignment model. And um, that's very hard. Yeah. It, it, you know, the, the, the simplistic answer is if you've got random noise and something moving randomly, the best estimate is to just take the average. But on a year-by-year -year basis, guessing or, est or forecasting what, you know, what the noise in the model is will, will, be, will be difficult. Yeah. Um, I mean, given that you know, already the conversation is... is, is, is identifying problems with the, the estimated model, and you mentioned you know, basing uh, an alternative approach on outturn data. I'm just wondering, from a practical point of view, what would be involved in that? Because clearly it would mean creating separate uh, Scottish uh, VAT points for businesses. It would be a yeah. major burden on businesses. Yeah. Haven't, they done, haven't they done any thinking about what the impact of that would be, what the impact on business would be, what the cost would be Good of, of, of doing that alternative approach? Charlotte. Our membership has always adamantly been against that. Uh, you see the kind of problems disentangling with Brexit, you know, pulling Britain out of, of a European market. We'd have similar problems here if we'd have to set up a separate Scottish kind of VAT network. And the whole point of VAT is that it's designed for a single big market because it goes in and out, in and out, in and out on a production, uh, adding value as it goes along. And I think... Uh, just in broad principles, members in business, members in practice would be very much against the, the imposition of having to go and do all that administrative work. And even then, I'm not convinced that you'd truly nail it down as to what is Scottish VAT. Uh, and certainly in immediate terms, businesses, I think, are under pressure around other elements, whether it be Brexit or making tax digital for VAT. Uh, I don't think they would welcome it at all, if that's any help. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. I think that, that, that's, a, that's a response that I think would, would be expected from business in these circumstances. But the point of my question wasn't to suggest that we should do that. Was it should we concern that we, the system we're going to use, because we can't do it, um, is, is it going to be robust enough? Uh, yes, I was toying with that very problem coming down the road this morning, because uh, we wouldn't want to account specifically for Scottish VAT uh, and we see the problems in this model but I think the assignment model is better ultimately than trying to identify proper true out outturn okay. VAT. Okay. John? Thank you. Uh, I mean just one point on that. I, 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 don't, I think it would be understandable to look at it. Well it, it would be very burdensome but you might get a more accurate result but 
in one respect, I don't know that you would even then get an accurate result because, of course, you would need to design rules to say what Scottish VAT is. I mean, uh, if you look at where the place where a supply for VAT purposes is deemed to take place, that's something that even within the European Union they've kind of redesignated from time to time. Uh, you know, when we have the Scottish income tax come in, uh, ultimately an, a, a, an approach to defining Scottish residents was adopted, which is different from what defines UK residents for, uh, for a mixture of practical and you know other reasons. So I don't think you would kind of end all discussion and say, oh, there's a simple answer. That's you know a Scottish receipt. You'd have to actually consider and design a whole set of rules to define what it was and then make businesses do it. So I don't think, you know, it would be burdensome, but it wouldn't end all the argument about whether we got it right. Patrick, I guess that leads into some of the area you were interested in. Uh, maybe it's not the right time, but if it isn't, forgive me. But is I'll... there a right time? Um, <laughs> I mean, I suppose what I'm interested in is why we are doing this. Uh, you know, as I was saying to, to colleagues before before the meeting started, I was on the Smith Commission, and um, I, I I didn't argue against the the proposal to assign VAT, uh, but I was uh, never a wild enthusiast for the idea that that simply assigning a proportion of of VAT would would achieve any actual objectives, and I can understand the desire that that we had to have a. a big number in terms of the, the total proportion of, of the Scottish budget that came from uh, taxes that are in some way under the control of, of Scottish ministers or, or the Scottish Parliament. But in the absence of the ability to use policy levers to, to change the rates or bans or to redesign that, to, for example, incentivise or disincentivise different kinds of consumption to achieve social or sustainability objectives, um, in the absence of, of um, a great deal of control over things like how much of, of the money people spend goes through uh, shops on high streets in Scotland as opposed to Amazon accounts, um, what are we actually going to achieve by doing this? And if it's ended up being more complicated and less convincing than we thought it might have done, uh, should we step back and think again at this point? I mean, there is, there is going to be a review of the fiscal framework. When, when that happens, should we, should we review this as well and decide, uh, in the light of what happens over the next few weeks in UK politics, for example, should we decide whether a different approach is desirable or, or achievable? So um, I think you know, looking at what the Smith Commission was trying to do, um, and you were on it, I wasn't, so I won't second guess it, but the principles of what, was, what my understanding of what it was... <laughs> my understanding was trying to do was trying to build in accountability um, for the performance of the Scottish economy having impact on the budget and I think when you that's fine in principle but when you look at the methodology about the practicalities of how VET will be able to will be able to do that there's so much uncertainty within the statistical measures there's a big question mark about even if the Scottish economy was be changing relative to the rest of the UK would that be actually reflected in the VAT revenues that you receive here in Scotland? And given the uncertainty about the calculations, it could well be the case that that doesn't happen. So there's a fundamental question about whether that link on accountability is actually achievable with the assignation, given the complexities of the, the, the process of, of assigning VAT. It's not, so the principle about assigning VAT is solid, but the actual practicalities of doing it, given the, the, the costs uh, and the risks involved, I think then there's a second question that the committee might want to reflect on as well about the transparency of the system. And we've already seen that, the challenges around that with people understanding how income tax works, what happens when the statistical estimates change around income tax. But that's based on a much bigger sample, much bigger and more robust than VAT. So there's a question about transparency around the system um, uh, for that. And I guess then the final pr uh, point about uh, Smith Commission as well, about the, the, the ability to use Scottish Government levers or Scottish Parliament levers in order to influence the budget. And that wouldn't happen with VAT, even, not even talking about the ability to change VAT rates, but actually be able to trace through changes in government policy mm -hmm. having an impact on VAT numbers. I think there would be question marks around that but as well. Does it, does it not also rest on a deeper assumption that at a, a kind of overall scale, a, a, a country scale, more consumption of, of, of VAT chargeable goods and products is by definition a good thing? 
uh, and that what government is, is going to be accountable for is just maximising that, however. Yes and no. So yes in the sense that if your economy is growing more quickly in the UK, so you're not changing the pattern, you're not changing levels of consumption or encouraging people to consume more, but just your economy is growing more quickly, then that, would, that should show up in terms of your relative performance in VAT receipts. But you're right, you could be a situation where for the same level of growth, if you encourage people to spend more and to spend more on certain types of products, save less, then that would in, in boost our relative performance in VET. So that assumption would also, your, your comment you make is right in that context. You'd be encouraging people to spend more and there's so a question about whether that's right or wrong. There are incentives in there in terms mm -hmm. of what, what, whether the ec there's economic value in getting people to save less and spend more in, in all circumstances. Yep. Yeah, in that context, yes. Tom, did you have a comment? Yeah, just to pick up, uh, Patrick made reference to the review of the fiscal framework, which is due in the next couple of years. And one of the areas that we've discussed previously is whether any consideration should be given to greater flexibility around the Scotland Reserve, given the volatility of income tax receipts. And we've had m many discussions regarding forecasts. I think, from correct, Professor Royce, there was a confidence interval around perhaps a couple of hundred million. If we look at some of the other taxes, we'll be discussing landfill tax. I think the forecast for next year is about 104 million. I think the cumulative forecast for LBDT next year is about 646 million pounds. But 200 million pounds either way in that. There was 180 million pounds committed towards the attainment challenge, 120 million pounds to high scale. That is a significant element of public spending that's up in the air depending upon wh which way VAT receipts um, are forecast to be. If we are to take on VAT assignment as, do we have to relook at the fiscal framework and the provisions around the Scotland Reserve to give greater flexibility? Is there enough flexibility within the current arrangements to manage that volatility? Good question. Can you go? I'll come in on that. Thank, thanks, Convener. I, 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 th I think, okay. I think as, as Tom Arthur uh, explains, it's how all these things interact together oh, that yeah. provides the challenges to how those, uh, the, the extent of the management job. And where all the bets go against you, that could be a sizable number. Where things cancel one another out, it's less of an issue. And if all the bets go for you, for you, there's effectively a real challenge as to how can you spend that windfall in a way that doesn't commit spending that you don't necessarily have the funding for in future years. So that, that's inherent in the system. In terms of the review of the fiscal framework, there's something about, at this stage, we've not had for the big taxes, certainly for income tax or for uh, for v certainly for VAT assignment, any sense of the actual numbers and the actual reconciliations that will be pl taking place. So we can talk about it in conceptual terms. We've seen what's happened in the devolved taxes, but as Social Security plays through, as mm -hmm. uh, income tax plays through, and as VAT assignments that plays through, that's when we begin to get a much more of a greater handle on what's the size of that volatility. And I think it's important that we have a degree of track record to help support that review of fiscal framework where we can get us more of a sense of the numbers. A challenge for us all at the moment is to get a sense of, well, how much are we talking about? And we've got some numbers, we've got some revised forecasts that give us some sense of that, but until we've got more of a track record, that'll be a hard thing to do. I think particularly in relation to VAT assignment, we've got a conceptual model, we don't have the detail behind that model yet, and what we've got so far is no sense of how that would play out historically and how, how much that level of volatility is in, uh, contributing to that. So it's a big challenge. Given the, the forecast that with the caveat, they are forecast reconciliations, I think, 145 million, I think, 472 million. Would it be prudent, perhaps, to delay the implementation of that assignment until we've actually seen what the outturn uh, actually transpires to be for the previous two, well, this and the previous tax year regarding income tax? We won't have any outturn. No. We won't have any outturn for that, but to get a sense of how the outturn actually matches up to the forecast, to get a sense of what volatility exists. Oh. With yeah. regards to income tax. Well, we'll begin to get a picture of that in July, I think it uh -huh. is, when the first figures, whether it's 185, I think it was. 145. 145. We'll, we'll find out in July we'll out. How, how real that was. Sorry, Dr. Paul Matthews. Thanks. Um, just to come in on the point of reconciliations and volatility, mm -hmm. there's, of course, two moving parts. You've got the SFC's yeah. forecast, which is going to be moving, and because they're quite rightly completely independent of the OBR. Um, their forecast can move in totally different ways uh, to how we choose to forecast. And then we will be going at different times as well, which can be particularly tricky. Our UK VAT forecast is actually really quite stable. 
it ticks along quite nicely. Um, the previous year, plus a little bit of growth, is a fairly good predictor of what's going to happen next year at the UK level. But that's mostly because we haven't really had any major policy changes. Who knows if there will be policy changes coming up in the future? And I think you might have quite a risk if, say, at a UK budget there was a policy event and then it would be required for the next forecast, the Fiscal Commission to sort of react and sort of feed through what would that mean for the Scottish assignments and then those differences could be set at different points in time feeding through so the reconciliation ultimately when it happens when the outturn occurs could be done on sort of two different bases. Um, the, the OBR looking at one set of policy positions and the Fiscal Commission another. If I could just ask a question, and I appreciate how we only able to answer this in a technical, from an OBR perspective, but were the UK to leave the European Union without a deal, it's been suggested that that would be on a party of what happened in 2008. Now, I believe, if I remember correctly, the policy response was to reduce the 80 to 15 per cent. If such a policy lever was pulled, would that make it almost impossible for this year to be an effective year to, as a transition year from that, or would it make no difference? I think it'd be very difficult to know what's going to happen. Uh, to <laughs> Just give that as one potential example. Yeah, consumption. But, but the, the point is, we've, we've actually had a really, you're completely right, we've had a really stable period of VAT policy compared to things like income tax and then stamp duty, LBTT, which are chopping and changing a lot, the policy design. It, it has looked very stable. And then, as you say, if there was a desire to boost consumption in the short term and VAT was used as a policy lever... It, things can move quite dramatically. I think that's been very helpful, kick off and start. But I think we need to start getting to some of the nitty gritties around me methodology. So, our next topic for discussion um, on the robustness or transparency of VAT assignment methodology, I invite James Kelly to kick that off. Okay, thanks a lot, convener. We've started to drift into elements of this discussion in the uh, previous section. But um, I suppose to put this in context, uh, what is trying to be achieved here is to look at the UK uh, VAT calculation uh, to calculate the, the Scottish share and to assign an element of that Scottish share in the Scottish budget. And bearing in mind the, you know, the budget is important in terms of expenditure, the decisions taken by the Scottish Parliament, it's important that that assignment is accurate. <coughs> Um, so to try and achieve that, the governments jointly have produced a paper with uh, setting out a methodology. Um, for that to work, um, the, the methodology has got to be robust so that it produces accurate calculations and also has to be transparent so that people viewing the calculations and ultimately what is assigned into the Scottish budget have confidence in that. So um, what we're interested in in this section is looking specifically at the methodology that's been outlined by both governments in this paper, how does it serve that purpose of being robust and, and delivering, delivering accurate VAT assignment and uh, giving, giving transparency uh, to try and inspire some confidence in the, the calculations. You want to kick that off again? Okay, um, yeah. great. Thank you. Um, so a few things on that. I think, I think I think it would be great to see a lot more detail from both governments about the methodology. So you're talking about a 16-page report um, with no numbers and no estimates of sensitivity about how these numbers are changing or moving around, <clears throat> and this is £5 billion pounds worth of revenues. So I think a lot more information about the, exactly your point about the, the robustness, the methodology is going into it. It's already well talking about a methodology, but what does that mean in practice in terms of the estimates? Um, and then to give you an example of that, so the way the methodology will work for about 70% of that, that will look at consumers' expenditure and VAT, and it relies on one survey called the Living Cost and Food Survey. Now, to give you an assumption of that, in GERS, for the last few years, you're talking about maybe 500 households maximum in Scotland being surveyed for, for part of that. The governments have boosted it as part of this part of this um, new methodology. But you're probably talking, I don't know exactly, but you're probably talking maybe a thousand households max um, on the living cost and food survey. Um, now, to put that in context, you had 2% of taxpayers for the, for the um, survey of personal income. It's about 50,000, you know, versus 
you know, a, a, you know, a few hundred or hundreds in the context of living costs and food surveys. So the robustness of that estimate is always going to be much less than it would be for um, for other taxes, and that does create problems. Is to Martha men mentioned, you know, that it means that the, the spread of confidence, the spread of errors in there are quite large, so a couple of hundred million pounds either side. And to give you again another example of that, so in the most recent GERS numbers, when the government boosted the living cost and food survey, um, in looking at the latest number they had, so that was 16, 17, that took 300 million pounds out of Scottish VAT um, estimates just simply by boosting the sample there. So it's so it, nothing to do with difference in performance, but just because you increased the sample size of that survey, there was a, a revision down of 300 million from the Scottish VET share and a revision up of 300 million on the, on the UK share. And that just illustrates the potential sensitivity of this methodology um, to, to revisions in the analysis that goes into it. And I think much more transparency about just the potential for that to be an embedded feature of VET assignment would be really helpful. Angela, and I think John wants to contribute as well. So thank you, convener. Uh, picking up on uh, Graham Roy's points on some of the issues around surveys that the Living Costs and Food Survey um, in particular, uh, and how you know robust and reliable that information is, given that the transition period is, 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 is one year only, um, I'm wondering whether, you know, survey information based on one year only is is the best way as well, given that 2019 to 20 uh, will also coincide with other potentially uh, major events um, around Brexit. I mean, why one year? You know, would maybe one year would normally be okay, but you know, 2019. 20 might be a unusual year mm. you know why not three years um or you know yeah. is, is there any way for it to be reflective or a kind of rolling survey mm -hmm. so the way it works in <coughs> in jairs at the moment i don't know if this is the same for this new methodology but the way it works in they actually use a three-year average for for the survey but that's not for any structural reason other than simply because the quality of the survey is is relatively weak in the context of the number. So you have to use a three-year average to give you mm -hmm. some degree of confidence in it. But I think you're right. That then opens up some interesting questions. Like if the whole purpose of this is to, pr to, to improve accountability on a year-by-year -year basis, if you're using an average over a number of years, then you, you break that link between accountability and policy changes and actual outcomes because you're smoothing the actual numbers over a number over over a period of time, but I think your general point. I think it would be really helpful to see perhaps in the next iteration of material we see from the government, just about how sensitive the estimates are to whether you use one year, two year, three year spreads. What happens when you use different um, uh, you know numbers of people being surveyed? So if you add an extra hundred people or two hundred people mm -hmm. or into this estimation, does that radically change the results? The results from last year suggest that it does. If you add in more households, and it will potentially need to lead to fluctuations in, in the numbers that come out. So I think much more information about just how sensitive this methodology is to the data that you put into it um, would be really helpful. So perhaps, convener, that's something we need to pursue with both governments, you know, this, the, the size of surveys, but also the time frames yeah. as well. Okay. John Allen? Yeah, <clears throat> I think the, the, the fundamental point that Graham making, is making is really important, that <clears throat> there's a real need for, <clears throat> pardon, there's a real need for sort of much greater transparency in the, um, in, in the details of the assignment model. We have a slight advantage because we, we had to produce a forecast in December, so we've seen some preliminary versions of the assignment model and the data. And in fact, if you look at our December report, you can see that we, in effect, published the 2016 outcome for the assignment model as it in, in its very preliminary form, which hadn't been agreed by the JEC. I think I have a slightly different take on, on, on the sampling issue to Graham, and I think, I think basically this just underlies the difficulty of you know, two people working in the same sort of field getting hands on information and the, and, and the sense the way we desperately need this, this is published. Um, in our September statement of data needs, which we, 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 we published, we, we asked very clearly um, that the government, the two, the two governments, published the assignment model and, they pu and, and, and the underlying data. 
Um, and they did this through an official statistics publication which all the users were consulted on, and, and as far as that hasn't happened yet, and we still don't have published data, although we have some access to some data. My understanding, just to go back onto the, the, the technical issue about the, the, the survey, my understanding is that the preliminary assignment model just uses one year as opposed to three years. Um, and also that the, the sample side has been boosted, so it's been doubled. And for the next iteration to be published, the number of households responding will go up to 720. In the current version, which is published in 2016 data, it's 360 households, which is 0.03% of the number of households in Scotland. Um, the, the issue, I think, in the 2016 data wasn't so much that the sample size had increased, but that um, there had been in-sample variation. So because the sample size is relatively small, the, 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 basically the, the, the switch between... Um, there had been an estimated switch between sort of um, zero-rated exempt goods and reduced rate and, and the, the, the standard rate, and that caused that sort of drop, drop in VAT receipts. But I think <clears throat> all that underlies the volatility issue because we think that was a rogue drawing of the sample, um, and also the need for, for um, much more transparency and a publication of the, sort of the underlying details of the assignment model. Did you say that the, the boosted number was 700? 720 respondents. So, so that's, an, you get about, a, on these sort of surveys, you get about a 40% response rate. So we're basing our outcomes on what VAT estimates are on 700? No, not years. quite, not quite. What you're doing is that you're using the information from those 720 households to estimate a split between exempt, yeah. zero-rated, reduced, and standard-rated VAT. And then, so once you've got that sort of un that, that weighting, you can then use the consumption data to estimate VAT. So it's only, a, it's, it's a detail, but it's an important detail. It's a very small number, though. It's a small number, but, but you know, um, these sort of surveys, and again, this is the need for transparency. Um, don't be thrown by the, sm the small sample size necessarily. Um, okay. We don't know. What we need to know, is, and, and what the, I think we need to have published, are the confidence intervals around that, around that sample size. Okay. We, can I just, we, we, we are all thrown, I think, uh, by that small uh, sample. So why shouldn't we be thrown by it? Why, why, should, why should we feel reassured that that's, uh, be, that's a big enough number? Okay. Um, why shouldn't you feel reassured? Because... Um, the statistical properties of samples don't vary in size with the sample size. They vary in the size of the square root of the inverse of the square root of the sample size. <laughs> <laughs> Which means... <laughs> Which means, crudely, as you increase the sample size, you get diminishing returns to scale in the increased accuracy. Right. And as you reduce the sample size, you have a smaller size you get. You clear? Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Mark, I've got a couple of politicians who want to come in as well. Just on the transparency point, and, and, and you'd expect me to say transparency is really important there, and there's, t there's two elements to that. One, the one we've talked about, which is effectively publishing workings and the detail so that, so that people can understand the detail, but there is something, and, and it's apparent already for the methodology, there are lots of details, and we've been talking about one of them, and there are many, many more which are built on ONS uh, estimates, Scottish Government uh, uh, economic estimates, which themselves are built on lots and lots of details. So, the, so transparency as far as all that workings is really important, and I absolutely subscribe to that, but also transparency in terms of interpretation and assessment of things like what's the extent of risk in there, and, and, an, and a professional assessment from those that are putting the estimates together about the extent of that. Now, we've got some of that at the, the detailed level for the things that this is built on that are already published by ONS and Scottish Government. It's how does that get aggregated up so that the so that, that transparency includes a sense of the things that we were talking about today. Neil, yeah, the, the document talks about um, unregistered uh, traders, and obviously there could be a variance between Scotland and the UK on that. I, I wanted to ask about the impact of the the cash only economy, and whether that is a, um, a you know higher or lower in Scotland than the rest of the UK, and and could that have an impact on on the VAT figures? Sorry, Willie. I just wanted to ask, I mean, businesses are VAT registered in Scotland. Is it not a safer methodology to just pick out the actual location <laughs> data that's coming in, much in the same way as we did with the income tax thing, which we all know was a great success <laughs> in estimating the, the numbers of Scottish taxpayers? Should I mean, we not Charlotte do it? may give you a reason why that wouldn't work. I or maybe I'm wrong, but... 
it's, it's, it's more difficult than just individual traders because you could have large businesses here, but their businesses everywhere. Okay. So what's Scottish? You could have lots of consumers buying stuff online. Uh, do you know where are they buying it from? What are you trying to measure? Uh, and the whole concept of VAT is that it kind of sits around a business. So any business that you have will have input tax coming into the business and output tax coming out, and you marry one against the other. And in a production line, say you've half a dozen processes, in, out, in, out, in, out. And of course, you know how much uh, business goes across the UK. We've had discussions here before. It's quite difficult to pin down what is Scottish VAT, and I think it's partly that. We were talking about it earlier. You were as well, John. It's just really, it's actually quite difficult to, to pin down that model as well. Do you, okay. do you know, both the models have their difficulties. Right, let's, can, can I just bring this back to an area which I've got concerns about? It's just the very fundamental point about if we put rubbish into the system, we're going to get rubbish out. So, from what I understand, in broad terms, this model that for VAT assignment methodology works by applying VAT rates to the estimates of expenditure in Scotland through something called the Total Theoretical Liability Model. Now, I haven't seen anywhere in any of the descriptions from, from the Scottish Government or the UK Government about how successful that model actually is. If that's the model that's been calculated for the amount of the VAT, and maybe Paul can help us here, how is the output from that model actually compared with the, the outturn itself, the, 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 the actual outturn in, in itself? Does it work, is what I'm saying, because there's no evidence <laughs> at all in, in any of the papers we've got about how robust that model is. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy to comment on that. So it is, it works in the, our forecast for VAT, for the purposes that we're using it, which is forecasting, it's okay. But... Wait a minute, wait a minute. It's okay. What does that mean? Um, no, no, no. Okay. That. None of our forecasts are 100% accurate. No, and our VAT forecast at the UK level has lower errors than our average tax forecasts. So our UK VAT forecast is doing okay. <laughs> so that's a forecast compared with outturn? Yes, exactly. So, so what's but the, the, the key okay. thing so tell, is... Tell me, what is the variable in there then? What is yeah. the difference in that okay? Um, I'm going to answer a slightly different question, um, which is we know the money that's come in to HMRC, the receipts. <clears throat> that is a definite known yep. outcome. The VAT theoretical liability model is estimated built up from a lot of ONS estimates for consumption. Then there's various judgments made about what is standard rated and zero rated similar to the assignment methodology. So you get this total theoretical liability. Now this number is a lot higher than the actual VAT receipts. The difference between the two is known as the tax gap, the VAT gap. It's a residual. There's lots of things we don't know what is going on in there. It could be um, genuine um, aspects of the tax system which are not captured in the theoretical liability model. So, for example, businesses under the, the threshold. But it could also be things like avoidance and evasion that's taking place. This VAT gap is quite large. We're looking at sort of around 8%. For the forecast, this is not such a problem because, as we were discussing earlier, if the, the error is kind of constant going across the forecast, and this is what we assume with the VAT gap, other than some uh, measures, policies that the government, the UK government have introduced, generally it's doing an okay job holding it fairly flat. But it is a large difference. I guess so the real question for us is, this is a, because this is going to be a tax based on relativity between the two uh, jurisdictions, what will happen to the Scottish tax gap and how do we know how it's going to perform at the, what, what that level it's going to be compared with the rest of the UK? We, we, we will never know uh, because we will never have Scottish receipts. The differences between theoretical liabilities and receipts, which is known at the UK level, and we'll just have theoretical liabilities in Scotland. John? Um, could I just help um, just by giving some numbers, perhaps? Mm -hmm. Numbers can sort of tie things down. Just in, we, we, we've been looking at the, the OBR's forecasting record of this because it's obviously gives us a sense of how difficult this is going to be forecast in Scotland. 
if you go from the um, March 2012 forecast onwards, um, there are two, two year ahead forecasting um, error has been about 2.4% on average, which Paul is absolutely right, is, is, is lower than their, um, a similar sort of thing across all their fiscal forecasts, but it's higher than the income tax forecast error, which is about 1.7%. So you can, you can get a sort of sense of the relative magnitudes there. Um, and just on that, that VAT gap point, um, Paul's, my, my, my understanding is similar to Paul's, and certainly when we're doing our forecast model for the assignment model, um, we use the UK data on the tax gap to move from the Scottish um, theoretical tax liability down to um, our forecast of Scottish receipts. Okay, John. Okay. John. Thank you. I, I just want to say a bit about this difficulty of working out even conceptually where sort of that belongs. I mean, you know, last night I paid a hotel bill and there would have been VAT on it. So, you know, that hotel, you know, consumption was, you know, took place in Scotland. But, you know, I'm not a Scottish resident. Um, if I'd come up here for a kind of ordinary uh, run-of-the-mill business and that VAT was, you know, quite properly reclaimed, you know, it would depend on the outputs of that business, um, you know, what took place where. And if you just took the receipts from the hotel chain, you first of all, you know, if they've got hotels in England, uh, they'd have an extra job of work to break down what took place in Scotland. But even then, you wouldn't get to, you know, in quotes, the right answer. So I, th I think we've got, you know, here, here we've got out, um, forecasts, you know, which possibly stand to be corrected by outturns. But I think we've also got estimates for things where it's not even totally clear what the conceptually right, accurate answer is. Uh, I, that, that, that's, that's the difficulty, I think. Question, Paul, and, uh, as well. In terms of the tax gap issue we're talking about here, am I, uh, in terms of the methodology that's going to be used for Scotland, frankly, I just don't know, will it just be assumed the tax gap is the same in Scotland then? Um, it, yeah, I think because it's going to be based on the theoretical liabilities in Scotland and theoretical liabilities in the UK, it kind of effectively ignores the tax gap. Okay. But there, there are many reasons why that the tax gap could change in lots of odds and strange ways, but I, I don't think that would be a particular problem for, for the assignment methodology. Okay. Any other questions folk have got in this area before I ask another one? Just before we move on from methodology, um, I noticed that in the paper produced by the governments that say the Scottish VAT assignment model is similar to the VAT revenue sharing arrangements the Canadian government uses with some Canadian provinces. So I just wondered if any of our guests knew which Canadian provinces uh, and how that was working out uh, and whether the affected Canadian provinces were happy with arrangements or yeah, how, not. How robust is it in Canada? Because if it's going to affect what we do here, we need to know. You're looking at me. Well, um, I, I, I'm, yeah. I, I should say, uh, we are, just, just a bit of context, we are publishing a new forecast this afternoon, um, so we have been very busy. I read this uh, on the train up, and that exact point on the Canadian provinces was very interesting. I, was, I made a note to look into it, because clearly looking at international uh, context is really useful for these things. This is what we've tried to do on income tax to understand behaviour changes, looking at different states in the US, different parts of Switzerland. And so actually looking at some international comparators, that, that would, I think, be a potential good step forward for this work. I just wondered if anybody here today knew anything about the international comparators. Graham, have a go. A, a couple of things on, on the Canadian example. I think one thing we have to be slightly careful is trying to read direct comparisons between models which are contextually quite different. So in, the, in Canada, for example, yes, there is a common, in most provinces, there's a common GST sales tax that goes across all of Canada, but in many cases, on top of an existing domestic sales tax that is levied within the province. So they actually have outturn data, which helpful as a benchmark that you can compare against what's happening at the, at the federal level. I think Two other points about on the Canadian example. One is that one is that the quality of Canadian data is actually really quite high. Uh, 
So they produce lots of economic accounts at a provincial, at a province level, which we don't have in the Scottish context. So they produce national, effectively national accounts in many cases, at a, 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 a kind of a state or a, a province level, which then gives you much more accurate information that you can then draw on and also compare against in, in these uh, in these instances. And again, the third thing, which again gets back to maybe one of the more principles about on the Smith, where Smith was heading in this. In Canada, my understanding of what, what this what the system in Canada is really designed to do is to try and be used as a way of helpful just equalization or at least providing a mechanism to, to increase the share of, of Canadian tax revenues that flow amongst amongst the states. Whereas it's less about giving accountability to states to try and grow their economy in that context. It's more just about assigning, just apportioning revenues across the Canadian provinces that is something that's set at a national level. Whereas the context here is quite different. It's about, you know, it's about injecting accountability into the Scottish budget and not the other parts of the UK. Whereas in Canada, it's quite a different system. Okay. But would it be quite good to look at um, the data that is produced elsewhere and, and how that that's configured and, um, you know, how, how the evidence is, is found, if you like. I appreciate yep. entirely the, the point about context. And yep politics and systems are different but in terms of the, the range of information yeah. and you know how they gather information yeah. might be helpful yeah very much so i think where this is getting into is um and where the whole fiscal framework is getting into is, is lots of questions about it is the is the uk system for the public finances and statistics robust enough to cope with devolution mm -hmm. um and transfer significant <coughs> public finance powers to devolved governments and when you look at places like Canada, they have much more information, much more accessibility to data than we do. So there's a qu it's more a so there's a question about whether we whether the, the pace of change in the statistics and the data that's available in the UK is is able to cope with what's happening at, uh, uh, in the wider fiscal framework context. Okay, thank you. And is it appropriate to use that Canadian model and apply it here? Is it safe for us to be doing that? I think what the, I think my understanding of what they're talking about in the paper is that this idea that um, you're apportioning the national tax based upon consumption within um, provinces is the general principle of what happens in Canada. I guess the question then comes into and no one and from uh, from this context that would seem to be the sensible way of doing VET. The question is, do you have sufficient robust data and information that lets you do that in a way which can can minimise the risk and give you the confidence? Okay, doc. Can I ask one more question in this area before we move on? Because it's I, I just I, I just don't believe the numbers. That's, so I just want to make sure I'm not. I may be wrong. I'm, I'm quite often wrong. So let's just test it. One of the things they're going to obviously apply to this system is domestic tourism, in terms of the the VAT it'll be taken from it. And according to page four point four three six on the annex to the Scottish VAT assignment summary of assignment model. According to the 2014 tourism figures, English and Welsh visitors spend about £1.7 billion in Scotland, and Scottish visitors spend about £1.2 billion in England and Wales. Now, intrinsically, that just seems to me cannot be right, with a population of 50 million spending £1.7 billion as a population of Scotland of 5 million spending 1.2 billion. I, I just, I, 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 it's my sense that that figure needs to be challenged, um, right? Or, or is it, has anybody got any thoughts? If it, nobody's got any thoughts, I'm going to challenge the figure. Because <laughs> it just seems to me intrinsically it can't be right. But there's nobody responding to it. So, on you, Paul. Um, I'm not going to comment specifically on that figure, but there are a lot of other data sources beyond the Living Cost and Food Survey, which are mentioned in here. And I think one of the, the things that you probably want to be concerned about is how const maybe that's right, maybe it's wrong, but actually if the error is constant, then it shouldn't be a problem. But if this is going to chop and change and the 2014 tourism figures are replaced with a new survey and they use a different methodology and suddenly those estimates change dramatically, then obviously that will feed through the, the assignment model and be quite different. Um, and there are other aspects where the methodology is using things like the annual survey on hours and earnings, which is 
an okay data set, but we're looking into a, a much better one, the real-time information from HMRC. And if you are moving the data sources, then you're potentially moving the error and thus the assignment. I, I would agree with what Paul has said. I'm, I think for what it, what it brings down to me is, again, we need much more transparency about what the assignment model has, um, the data sources it uses, yeah. and also an understanding of the variability and the methodology of those data sources. So in a sense, the sooner that the, the two governments can publish something, I think everybody, everyone's interests will be well served. Well, we'll move on. Um, our final theme in, in this is issues around VAT forecasting risks of the Scottish budget. I guess we're into that area anyway, Murdo, but do you want to take it on, please? Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, convener. And we, we've obviously already touched on this to an extent, um, but maybe I could start off by asking about VAT forecasting, maybe come to you first, John, saying if you've got that happy job in due course to try and address. And I suppose my two, my two sort of starter questions, which overlap, is are um, how, how does forecasting VAT compare in difficulty to forecasting income tax receipts, for example, which is something else Fiscal Commission are doing? And secondly, what is the, the short-term risk from forecasting error, and how might this be managed within the context of the Scottish budget? So is it, is it difficult, um, more difficult than income tax? It's just different. So mechanically, it's actually quite straightforward because we have um, an economic forecast. We take the components of that economic forecast, particularly consumption, we put them into a relatively simple model, and that comes the result. Whereas the income tax model is, is much harder because it has much much more data, it has um, a very large sample size in relative terms, and we have the individual micro data. So in terms of technical difficulty, forecasting VAT is relatively straightforward. I think the, the question probably wasn't about that, though. It, it was more about um, how difficult in conceptual terms and how, how difficult it is to get an accurate forecast. And there, I think, the, sort of the, the, the experience of the OBR is, is interesting. Even with a richer data set and out, outturned data, their forecast error around VAT is, is larger than their forecast error around income tax. Um, I think, as I said before, the, the, the real conceptual problem for us is, is, not, is, is not so much estimating what VAT assign levels are. It's because the sort of the surveys which are used in the assignment model, model are volatile, and we have to predict, the volat predict those volatility, the volatility in those surveys, and that's really hard. So the, 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 the example that we already have to hand is the December forecast we published, where there's a rogue drawing. We, we think there's a rogue drawing from, the, from the, um, the, the living costs and food survey for 2016, which suppressed consumption. And that, that caused the, the forecast to be lower. Um, but how do you make that judgment? And, and, and how, because, the, because the reconciliations will work around that sort of that rogue drawing, how do you, in, in advance, guess what that rogue drawing will be or forecast what that rogue drawing will be? And that's tremendously hard. So that, that, that's the forecast mm. difficulty. Um, what impact will it have on the Scottish Government budget? Well. As yet, um, because the Joint Exchequer Committee hasn't made a decision, um, we don't know what the arrangements are. But let's just assume that it's like income tax. And if you think about the sort of the data that goes into the assignment model, um, it's the sort of the, the UK Blue Book um, is particularly important because of the um, the outturns at the the RUK level, the rest of the UK level, and the, the lags there suggest that it's a similar sort of lag to income tax, so 18, 18 months to two years. So if you think about income tax and the sort of reconciliations issues with that, then I think you've got a good idea of the sort of mechanics of the issue, or the likely mechanics of the issue. In terms of the numbers, well, we took the OBR um, average forecast error of 2.4%, and if you applied that to sort of the magnitude in Scotland, you're talking about an, an, an average error of ooh, the low hundreds. So somewhere between an average error of approximately between, say, 100 million and 200 million. But that's just an average error. So that gives you a sense of um, the potential issues. Now, as, as everyone keeps saying, the reconciliation depends upon the combination of forecast errors for the, for, for the Scottish VAT and also for the rest of the UK. Mm -hmm. So it's not just that, that number, but you're, you're talking about something which is not as potentially large as income tax in sort of magnitudes, but, but, but pretty, pretty chunky. Paul, do you want to reflect some of that discussion? Um, I think I would just bring in the point, when we say forecast error, 
Um, this isn't necessarily a bad thing that we would be, you know, we, we got something completely wrong. Um, it can actually be just policies that we weren't aware of at the time. So if there is a policy change, then our forecast for the year ahead is obviously going to be different because the policy has changed. Um, and VAT has been relatively stable as a policy area compared to, say, income tax, which has been changing all the time. And if we have sort of these policy uh, errors and trying to understand policy costings, as we know from income tax, that's, that's pretty hard, understanding what the behaviours are going to be around this. That could add a, another slice of variance on top of your existing, um, well, the, the economy forecast error, plus the sort of methodology error of trying to get to your survey. And then you've got policy costing error on top of that. We could have quite wide confidence in these falls. Getting about D'Angelo's point that she made earlier, if we're now talking about risk to the Scottish budget, to reduce that risk to the Scottish budget, would it be ad advisable, the right thing to do, to spread this, you know, to, to do this over a three-year period instead of just taking an encapsulation of what's going on in one year to make sure that we're reducing some of that risk? I don't know if that would be the right thing to do or not, but I'd like to get some reflection. John? <coughs> Is the division of labour between the, the Commission and the government here is, is very clear that it's our job to do forecasting, their job to design the assignment model. But um, as a statistical thing, if you pool sample sizes by averaging over years, you increase increased reliability. Increased reliability, so that would reduce the risk. Mm -hmm. okay. sure. yeah. so, um, Just picking up on that point, I think two things. What would be really helpful to see is is within the numbers, what happens when you start to do that? So does it reduce the risk? What happens when you boost the sample size? Do these numbers move around a lot? And then you get an idea back to, is the, is the, is the Scotland Reserve mechanisms, are the borrowing power sufficient to cope with the level of risk that exists within that? And it'd be really helpful to see in the next iteration of the papers that the government's produce just how robust the numbers are to that. But that, I think, gets back to a more fundamental question that you, again, may want to reflect on, that if you're having to rely on three-year moving averages for the VAT revenues, mm -hmm. if you're having to wor worry about smoothing them over time, how does that get back to the point about accountability for why the, the policy is being assigned in the first place? Because the idea is that you should be held accountable for movements in the budget. That happens with income tax. So if you, you, you can then see if your outturn is lower, therefore you have to um, pay back the forecast. But if you're smoothing out... VAT revenues were three, four, five years, all you're really doing is replacing Barnet with something that's very similar to that, but it's just smoothed over a number of years. So you, you break that link between the accountability and, and the policy implications. Anybody else want to contribute at this stage? Paul? Um, I mean, just on the point of the sample and how it plays out, um, something that I would quite like uh, to look into, or potentially the governments to look into, is actually uh, the outliers in the sample and how much they matter. So potentially you take, because we've got 720 households, let's, let's remove kind of the most extreme spending one. How does that change the share? I mean, how would it feed through? What would that be the end result in terms of Scottish VAT? We're talking about 5 billion here. Would the change be millions, tens of millions, potentially from individual households who happen to be at the extreme of the sample. Um, just so that we can sense in future years, if the, the sample does change, you get more of these outlier households coming in, how much effect would that have? Mark? Just to come on and, uh, on Murder Fraser's second part to his question about how manageable is all of this. I think for me there's two aspects for this. One is something that we've said in Audit Scotland for a while is what's the government's uh, policy, particularly around reserves, but reserves and borrowing, and how does it how does it set up that policy in a way that enables it to uh, cope with whatever the uncertainty that is around at the corner, uh, and there's something important in there. There's then the question of that when adjustments are made, how do spending plans cope with that volatility, which inevitably will, will be there? To what extent does everything get baselined and then you're storing up problems for the future? Or to what extent are you able to modify your spending plans to cope with that volatility in a way that's more of a short-term response? Mm -hmm key to that, and this is where the real challenge is, is knowing what's a permanent and recurring effect because it's due to the economic performance and what is just, to use John Ireland's term, noise in the system. And, and that's a real challenge for government and for parliament to get a sense of those two components. But there's something about what, 
how does financial planning, how does financial management get ready for the inevitable volatility <laughs> that's round the corner? Mark, you also talked about transparency. And one of the things that we got from David Eisner in his paper to us was around that issue. Um, and I could just pick out some of the words there, just some, some else that I think we need to reflect on. The paper states that the model calculates that the VAT incurred in each of the sectors at UK level is done by using confidential HMRC data and intermediate consumption figures, but gives no further information on this and then says the Scottish share of VAT in UK exempt sector is calculated using market data. It's all complicated, but effectively a lot of this has been done on confidential HMRC data, which we do not get access to. Do you think this is appropriate in the way we're trying to design a new model for Scotland? I think what I'd say is that, that absolutely I'd recognise that, there's, that, that there's, there's likely to be an appetite from Parliament, from the Scottish Parliament, about a degree of independent assurance over some of that and some of those calculations. The questions then rise about how, how auditable is that uh, uh, and how, given all the problems that we've talked about or the challenges that we've talked about today, to what extent could you have an audit of the information in any case that would give you that degree of assurance? And then in the context of the recent agreement between the two governments about how audit and accountability works with the recent audit and accountability framework, to what extent are Audit Scotland and National Audit Office able to sit down, design and agree an approach that both gives the assurance that you would be looking for and is workable uh, given the complexities that we've talked about? I think where we start from is, is we recognise that as a legitimate question and one that we need to explore. But I think we also recognise the challenges in, right. in trying to give you, I think, the assurance that is inherent in your question there, convener, uh, 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 and, uh, but it's something that we're setting off to try and explore and try and understand. Having more information about how it works and where the numbers come from is a necessary part of that. Okay, thank you. John? Uh, thank you. I just wanted to say, if you like, on behalf of HMRC, I mean, they, they have a, a, a statute that governs them that basically makes it a criminal offence to uh, reveal anything to do, to do with particular taxpayers' affairs, but also anything that could be reduced to that. And okay. quite understandably, therefore, they have, you know, they have an institutional aversion to, uh, to, uh, to risking that. So, you know, in fairness to them, uh, I, I mean, I can totally see that, that the issue doesn't make for transparency or, or accountability or for, you know, being capable of explaining very easily to the public, particularly if there are adverse changes that are going to cost them more, more taxes. But to solve that problem uh, at the root, one would need to look back to that criminal statute. It's not just a question of, you know, HMRC behaviour, as it were. OK, that's a good balance. Thank you. Paul? On that point, we regularly bump up against yeah, that taxpayer confidentiality yeah. issue when we're trying to understand why forecasts have changed. And HMRC are very robust in defending taxpayer confidentiality. Um, but I think there could be something which is quite tricky here. Say, if outturn changed quite dramatically, and then the answer was, well, something's happened in some confidential data, and we can't tell you what it is, but you've got less money, or more money. Um, that might be quite a hard message to explain or sell. Yeah. John? <clears throat> having, having, again, because we've, we've had access to some of this data um, to do our forecast, um, I think that once the, the government's published the details of the assignment model, you'll get a very clear sense of where the confidential data is and how important that is. So um, I, I would just delay answering that question, really, until you see the details of the, of the assignment model. So we're going to get more than just the summary that we've been provided with. Already. So my understanding is that the the two governments, are, well, I know because I've been invited to it and I'm going, and th there's there's a workshop in the end of March where the governments are going to discuss this model in more detail. And I understand that they're hoping to publish something in, 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 spri in spring. Is that a workshop just to compete? Is that a workshop just involving governments and the agencies around about them? No, no. Well, no, no. I think it's, 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 it's an open workshop. Thank you. Um, Murdo, have you got any more questions in that area? Because one, no, one final question just from around the risk issues, um, just to finish off this session then. Um, just about what can the Scottish Government do to um, increase the growth of S Scottish VAT relative to the rest of the UK VAT revenue? What model, what things can we do that we can imp um, uh, increase the amount of VAT in Scotland? I bring, that brings us back to the very beginning, really, because what's the point if we don't have any levers? Any suggestions? Graham. Um, 
I think this gets back to the, it does come the, back to the conversation the, yeah. with yeah. Uh, Patrick Harvey earlier. I mean, the whole purpose of this from the Smith Commission was the idea that you can better link the tax base in Scotland to, and therefore the Scottish budget, to the performance of the Scottish economy. So all else remaining equal, if the Scottish economy can grow more quickly than the rest of the UK, yeah. then our our VAT base will grow more quickly than in the rest of the UK, all else remaining equal. Um, and that therefore builds in that accountability in Scotland would gain the benefits from that. And of course, if it grew, more, if it grew less quickly, then we would, we would take the risks. I think there's then questions um, about how you do that. And then I guess the debate about how you grow your economy more quickly and uh, all the issues that go with that. But then there is also the subtle point as well that for a certain level of growth, one way you could would be to try and get people to spend more money on vatable goods or to increase the proportion of income who or, of people who spend a lot of money on vatable goods. So again, a bit like where with income tax, where there's incentive to grow higher rate taxpayers because they pay more ta income tax, you would have the incentive to encourage faster growth in people who'd spend more money, essentially, um, if, if this mechanism was to work. Now, that, and that gets into some interesting questions about whether you want to do that and whether that's consistent with ideas of inclusive growth, whether that's consistent with ideas about um, shifting um, money away from, say, consumption into savings and vice versa. Um, but I think it's, it's quite hard to see unique levers where the Scottish Government could do something which would boost VET um, in, a particular, in a particular way, other than trying to just grow the economy more quickly. Okay. And there's what to contribute at this stage. Well, that's, that's the case. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank you for your contributions. I think it was a very useful beginning to our discussions because I, th I get the sense this is only the beginning uh, and hopefully will inform our sessions that we have with government in the future. Um, I, I think it certainly helped us greatly understand some of the challenges that exist. There's a lot of work to be done. That's pretty obvious. Again, thank you, though, but I suspend at this stage to allow a changeover of witnesses. Thank you very much.
Okay. Uh, colleagues, our next piece of business is to consider subordinate legislation relating to the Budget Scotland Act 2018, Amendment Regulations 2019 draft. We're joined for this item by Kate Forbes, who's the Minister for Public Finance and Digital Economy, and Scott Mackay, Head of Finance Coordination in the Scottish Government. Uh, before we come to the formal consideration of the Minister's motion, we'll take evidence on the Budget Scotland Act 2008 Amendment oh. Regulations 2019 draft, and I welcome our witnesses to the meeting and invite Kate Forbes, the Minister, if she wishes to make an opening statement. I will, if that's okay. Thank you so much, Convener. So the Spring Budget Revision provides a final opportunity to formally amend the Scottish Budget for 1819, and this year's Budget Revision deals with four different types of amendments to the Budget. Firstly, a few funding changes. Secondly, a significant number of technical adjustments that have no impact on spending power. Thirdly, some Whitehall transfers. And finally, some budget-neutral transfers of resources between portfolio budgets, including a modest budget redirection to ensure we maximise our available budget. So the net impact of all of those changes is an increase in the approved budget of um, 3,576.2 million from a uh, 40 Point, um, 505 um, billion to 44. You've got the numbers in front of you. I'm not going to read them out. Table 1.1 on page 5 of the supporting document shows the approved budgets following the autumn budget revision and the changes sought in the spring budget revision and the supporting document to the spring budget revision and the brief guide prepared by officials provide background on those changes. The first set of changes reduced the budget slightly by 3.3 million and comprises funding which has been allocated over a number of lines as detailed in the brief guide offset by the repayment of 175 million pounds of farmers loans FTs. The second and most significant set of changes comprise a number of large technical adjustments to the budget and those technical adjustments are mainly non-cash and therefore budget neutral as they cannot be redeployed to support discretionary spend elsewhere and have a net positive impact of 3,303.8 million on the overall aggregate position. It's necessary to reflect those adjustments to ensure that the budget is consistent with the accounting requirements and with the final outturn that will be reported in the annual accounts. So by far, the largest of those adjustments relates to an increase to the AMI provision for future NHS and teachers' pension costs. And that flows from the outcome of appeal court rulings on the judicial pension scheme and firefighters' pension scheme discrimination claims. The ruling has significant implications for future costs of unfunded schemes, and we've had to adjust the non-cash AMI budget by £2.3 to meet the potential future costs of remedy. And the UK government is expected to appeal this case further. And um, while the final position is not likely to be resolved for some time, that adjustment is made on the basis of legal opinion on the probability of a successful appeal. With regard to Whitehall transfers and allocations, there's a net positive impact on the budget from a number of transfers of 275.7 million, the most significant of which are the transfers of 157.3 million from the DW. Uh, DWP to fund the devolved responsibility for carers allowance and £78 million from Treasury in respect of the Agenda for Change Health Pay Award. The final part of the budget revision concerns a transfer of funds within and between portfolios, which committee members will be very familiar with, to better align the budgets with profiled spend. The main transfer between portfolios are noted in the supporting document and the guide. And as we uh, approach the financial year end, we will continue in line with our normal practice to monitor forecast outturn against budget and wherever possible, we'll seek to utilise any emerging underspend to ensure we make optimum use of the resources available this year and manage the necessary carry forward to meet additional spending commitments as disclosed in our draft spending plan. So finally, as I draw to a close in line with the recommendations of the Budget Process Review Group's recommendations, my officials have included in the brief guide sent to the committee an indication of the forecast outturn position at 31st January. That is the latest position available when the brief guide was prepared and hopefully has given the committee the best view of the emerging uh, position. Provisional outturn figures will be announced by the Cabinet Secretary in early June.
and I hope colleagues have found the guide helpful, although, as always, we are open to suggestions for ways to make it even more helpful. Okay, maybe I can start off there then, because it was helpful that was introduced as part of the budget process review group and information is now available. But you'll appreciate, Minister, that it's still a challenge for the committee and whether it's in the area of underspends or Scotland Reserve, given that that's a continually moving picture, and we appreciate that. There, but therefore, in order for us to carry out our scrutiny role more effectively, when the final balance of the, the reserve, for instance, is published in June, Will you be able to provide the committee with a table detailing all of the movements in the reserve throughout the year to bring that more, uh, make it more available to us and to, for our scrutiny role? And while I recognise more, more movement yet may transpire, are you in a position at this stage to see how much the reserve will be available to meet any of the potential shortfall that may come from the reconciliation process in relation to income tax? and the fully devolved taxes once the outturn figures are available in July, because that will be an important moment, obviously. Mm. So I suppose, yes, in principle, very happy to provide the committee with those final figures. Um, in terms of getting your head around the figures in front of it, as obviously um, members will be aware that that position changes um, quite regularly. So we were keen to give you the most up-to-date position, yep. but recognise that it means reconciliation can be a challenge. So very happy to commit to providing more information. You mentioned uh, the, the point around uh, devolved taxes and the need for a reconciliation and obviously that with the first reconciliation due next year um, as part of the, the forecast residual balance it states there uh, that um, devolved taxes income um, forms £136.2 million there to ensure that we are prepared for um, reconciliation. So it's £136.2 in the reserve to for that purpose and if it turns out that the estimate is correct. So that's the forecast. Okay. That's the forecast of the surplus tax receipts that we're holding in the Okay, in that's, the that's, that's, that's quite clear. Thank you. Murdo? Yes, thank you, Convener. Um, good morning, Minister. Just, just to follow up to the Convener's question, I'm looking at the um, forecast residual balance for 2019-20, which is in uh, 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 the table on Annex C for the, from, from the brief paper, and th there's a a balance forecast of uh, 300.2 million broken down. You just explained 136 million that's there uh, for devolved taxes income. There's 85.5 balance set aside to fund spending commitments. Can, can you just explain what those spending commitments are? Yep. So those spending commitments could, for example, be used, members will, will be aware of, uh, of recent coverage on things like teachers' pay. So those, uh, that balance that's set aside for future spending commitments um, will likely be used to support um, known pressures, for example, the teachers' pay agreement. So, so, but there's, there's not a specific ask that this is tied to at the moment. It's more of a kind of float that's there to deal with things that might arise in future. In the spirit of... of managing our finances prudently yes we recognize that over the course of the year there will be emerging challenges that need to be met so uh, that's reflected in the residual balance okay thank you and then just one more question convener the, the figure for financial uh, transactions 78.5 million where does that arise from is that is that treasury barnet consequentials so the um, financial transactions there are in relation to um that's, well, that's after allowing for additional spending commitments of £47.5 million in 1920. Um, and that is... Uh, Princi principally the repayments of farmers' loans that are contributed okay. into that balance. Okay, and, and presumably there are restrictions about what that money can be used for. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, and activities in hand to explore how we can best deploy that in 1920. Okay, all right, thank you. Anybody else got any questions? James? Just a small question on the uh, uh, residual balance in the reserve before I go on to another question. Um, this three hundred million uh, figure, does this include the fifty four million pounds uh, that was transferred to the reserve as part of the the, the information that was released by the Cabinet Secretary at stage three of the budget? So the fifty four million pounds, so in terms of the follow on from, so, the, the so that's the balance of the additional um, consequentials 
yeah. that were received late, very late on as a result of the, um, yeah. the UK supplementary estimate. So what, what we've tried to do in that table is, um, is, is show that net position. So that 300 does effectively include that remaining balance. Right, okay, I mean, that's, that, that's clear. So where, whereabouts is that then? And it's obviously included in one of the other lines. Well, you can see you can see in the table that was provided there, we we come down when we when we look at 1920 spending commitments, we've got the expenditure commitments reflected in the budget bill of 313.5. Yeah. Then the stage two additional funding of 94 gives yeah. you 407.5, and then we've we've brought in there those late additional budget consequentials. Um, in in offsetting those additional spending commitments, so. That, that just leaves the pot at the bottom. Is So we've brought the full amount in there in, in arriving at the, the remaining balance that's available. So, sorry, so just, <coughs> I'm not trying to be awkward, I'm just trying to understand it. So, so where, you're, you're saying you've brought that amount in, where, where is the you, 54 million included in what, what well line in that table? Yeah, it's the, it's, the, it's the difference between the 148 that's brought in there and yeah. the 94 that's already allocated. So the balance of 54 is effectively supporting wider expenditure. Right. But so we, uh, the, w the way it's reflected is it's just coming down yeah, to be reflected in the it's reserve. It's been deducted from that yeah. line. Right, OK. Right, that's fine. Um, it, in terms of the portfolio movements, there uh, was a, a, a £43 million pounds underspend in, in our... Uh, credit in relation to capital housing receipts. Have you got the background to that? So that's um, income from repayments of FTs uh, for the year, which are shown as negative expenditure, um, and so they look like a reduction in expenditure. But they're currently estimated at £43 million, which is made up of £29 million of shared equity receipts, £10 million of charitable bond receipts, and £4 million of other FT receipts. And estimates for the year have been made from the, the various trends to date um, and known scheduled repayments. Sorry. So what, why is that a negative then? Because it's it's known as so it's income from repayments of FTs. So it's shown as negative expenditure. So it looks like a reduction in expenditure, but it's it's presentational in terms of it being income from repayments of FTs. Right. Sorry, I'm not trying to go over, but if it's income, why I'm still not quite understanding why. If it's income, why is it been shown as negative? That's that's just the way income is is, is shown as it's. it's it's reflected as a, a, a minus in the overall. So it supports. The idea is that the income offsets expenditure, so it allows, right, yeah, okay, it allows yeah, further expenditure. Yeah, okay, right, I understand. Right. Um, and in terms of the, the enterprise budget, there's been a £56 million pounds underspend there that's been released elsewhere. So yeah. what Yeah. So that's a, that's a, that. I'll go into detail about that. that, that's a mix of different transfers, if I go through it um, in each aspect. So re the resource reductions um, are as follows, so the £6 million pound of uh, underspend in relation to enterprise zones, um, which is a result of the full construction oh. and operation contract not being expected to be in place between Scottish Enterprise and Strath Strathclyde until after a stage four review in late January 2019, which was later than initially forecast. And that's offset by five million, which uh, was deployed to the innovation and industries level programme to cover the costs of fire recovery fund. And in terms of the capital, which is again, financial transactions, the reductions of 55 million, which is a release of 28 million of emerging um, or planned underspend in FTs in relation to Scottish European in a growth co-investment project and the European Investment Fund and there's another £25 million of FTs which is a transfer to communities and local government portfolio in relation to investment into the Scottish Partnership for Regeneration um, of Urban Centres or SPRUCE as it's more commonly known and that's a transfer of funds for the First Building Scotland Fund uh, investment into SPRUCE which is seeking to complete a number of commercial and industrial uh, property investments uh, using that investment this year. Okay, thank you. Will it? Uh, Minister, I just wanted to ask about the £3 million pounds receipt from the UK Treasury for the presidential visit on policing. Was that, is that a fair and accurate 
uh, estimate of the cost of the policing for that to uh, visit and uh, do, do, do we have to claim that because I remember a bit of a discussion about whether Police Scotland were able to reclaim that money or not. So yeah that's obviously a Whitehall um, UK government treasury uh, transfer to cover the costs and you'll remember some of the the noises that were um, at the time of the presidential uh, visit uh, I think I can't remember which cabinet secretary it was at the time but I think it was who, who'd written to say that that seeing as it wasn't on the Scottish Government's invitation, that it should be covered by a Treasury. So that transfer recognises that commitment. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, there have been no other questions. We now move to item three, <coughs> which is consideration of the motion. I invite the Minister to move S5M16046, that the Finance and Constitution Committee recommends that the Budget Scotland Act 2018 Amendment Regulations 2019 Draft be approved. Moved. Do members have any other comments? And no other comments. And I put the question. The question is that motion S5M16046 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Uh, I thank therefore our witnesses for their contribution. Um, it was a very useful discussion. We'll now publish a report to the Parliament setting a decision later today. And I think we'll just continue, but we'll allow a changeover of government official. <coughs> Very neat transfer. <coughs> So our next piece of business is to consider the subordinate legislation relating to the Scottish landfill tax brackets, standard rate and lower rate bracket. We are joined for this item by Kate Forbes, again, the Minister for Public Finance and Digital Economy, and Ewan Cameron Nielsen, who's the Finance Director of the Scottish Government. Uh, but before we come to the formal consideration of the Minister's motion, we will take evidence on the Scottish landfill tax standard rate, lower rate order 2019. Again, I welcome our witnesses to the meeting and invite Ms Forbes, the Minister, to make an opening statement Just if she wishes. very briefly that the order specifies revised amounts for the standard rate and the lower rate. Um, so standard rate, the figures will be in front of you. And those proposed rates would come into effect from the 1st of <coughs> April 19. And uh, the committee members will wish to note that they match the UK landfill tax rates from 1920 as set out in the UK Finance Act because we want to avoid any potential for a, a new phrase that I learned this week, which is waste tourism, mm -hmm. uh, to emerge as a result of material differences between tax rates north and south <coughs> of the border. OK, anybody got any questions? Angela? Oh, Thanks, convener. Uh, good morning, Minister. I'm uh, interested in some of the underlying policy and rationale uh, in relation to the, the, to the taxation rates, but I suppose also the, the, the qualifying materials, which I appreciate is a, a sister regulation. Um, there's a recycling business in my constituency called uh, Brewster Brothers. Uh, they're an aggregate uh, supply company. So they recycle and reuse things like waste soils and inert waste. And that attracts uh, the lower rate um, of landfill taxation. And I suppose to put it simply, um, how I understand it is that dumping soils remains, um, in the words of this company, too cheap. And that the lower tax rate applied is contradictory to the circu circular um, economy. Um, in that it's easier to dump soils, which I appreciate are less polluting than, than, than other um, materials, but I wondered, um, bearing in mind we don't want to be uh, wasteful of, of any resource, and it's quite unusual for people to be arguing for increased um, taxation, I wondered whether the government had any plans to review um, you know, just the, the, the number of bans and the, the qualifying materials that mm. are slotted into the different taxation rates. Mm. Well, we obviously keep it all under review, but I think that point touches on a key uh, issue with this tax, which is, which is that it's trying to achieve two objectives. It's perhaps the only tax where we want to see a, a reduction in revenue uh, raised because it demonstrates that it's having its attended mm. uh, impact of reducing <laughs> landfill. And I mean, it's clear to see with the figures over the course of the last, um, over the last decade, that total landfill volume has fallen 
and looking at the forecasts which the SFC revenue forecast over the course of the next five years again uh, it demonstrates that it's having the intended impact of actually decreasing revenue from the tax. However, having said that, in light of the objectives of this tax, we'll certainly keep the rates under review. And one of the reasons for, for changing the rates this year is to ensure that we are achieving the objective and it isn't the case that materials are just being moved across a border, for example, but that we actually are reducing the overall amount of uh, landfill. So I think that example touches on the, the key objective of this tax, which is a, to you know, in, in bring in revenue, but secondly, to reduce landfill. We know that landfill is decreasing, which is good. We know that the revenue forecasts are decreasing, which ironically is good. But we need to keep an eye on um, unintended consequences, and particularly around the behavioural impact on companies. Okay. And I appreciate... Uh, can I convener that the, the Minister says that this is constantly kept under review, but I wondered if there was maybe a specific point um, in time, you know, either in the, the short or medium term future, where there will be a, a more granular look at unintended consequences. Mm. Yeah, and that has to be done in conjunction, obviously, with the Cabinet Secretary um, for um, the Environment. Uh, and I know that she and Mr Mackay um, will um, be meeting again in the not too distant future to discuss how both portfolios um, are, are managing this tax to ensure that it reaches its objectives. Okay, thank you. Alex, I, I neglected to bring in the last discussion, forgive me, and it's landfill to uh, My question in the last session was answered. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, um, in this, on this landfill tax, obviously we're, we're supportive of uh, landfill tax aims. Um, however, one of the unfortunate consequences is the increase in fly tipping. Uh, I just wonder if you could demonstrate how the additional revenue is going to go to those, you know, particularly councils, uh, who are having to deal with this issue. Yeah, well, obviously, with all um, sources of revenue, it, um, it is then redistributed through to local authorities. But I recognise that on an issue like this, it's got to be a partnership approach with local authorities because often local authorities are, are, are managing and doing the collections uh, as well. So... It, and of and SIPA have a key role to play too when it comes to fly tipping and they obviously launched their campaign um, in the middle of last year to raise awareness of fly tipping and make clear what the, the fines were for fly tipping. Um, but there's also a role too, I think, finally, just to close on um, different public bodies in Scotland working together well. So Revenue Scotland have developed a reputation for better compliance because they work so closely with SEPA. And uh, on landfill tax in particular, um, the, 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 the levels of compliance are improving significantly because of that partnership. So I think that's probably the key way where we will um, uh, get a grip of, of fly tipping as well as resourcing local authorities. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Good morning. Uh, you uh, you mentioned the Fiscal Commission uh, forecasts on landfill tax, Minister, and uh, those uh, those forecasts are based on a, a central assumption that the the ban on biodegradable waste going to landfill in 2021 will actually be implemented. Uh, and you'll be aware that that late last month, uh, COSLA expressed serious doubts on that, uh, saying uh, that they think it's unlikely. Uh, that that can be achieved uh, on uh, on the timescale expected. So, you know, if if it is implemented, that will continue to reduce the revenue from landfill tax. If it isn't, uh, obviously it, it may raise more revenue but fail to achieve the policy objective. So can I ask, first of all, what uh, assumption the Scottish Government is working on? Uh, is the Scottish Government working on the assumption that that ban will be fully implemented uh, in 2021 as planned? Uh, and secondly, moving on from that, if that does happen, obviously that means revenue takes a, a big hit, uh, but one of the consequences will be more waste going to mm. incineration, recyclable waste going to incineration, which obviously doesn't have a, a serious place in a, a truly circular economy either. The UK government has uh, indicated that it intends to look uh, at the option of introducing a tax on the incineration of waste, uh, and can I ask is the Scottish Government looking at that uh, and has it discussed uh, the potential for a necessary transfer of powers uh, 
uh, to, to implement that kind of policy. Thanks. Well, there's a lot of different questions in there, so I'll try and take them one by one. Firstly, you know, I'm very aware of the, the points that Patrick Harvey raises. This ban has been set in legislation since 2012. So it is disappointing, I think, that local authorities, haven't ha having had significant time to prepare, um, are there's still uncertainty around the readiness of, of some councils, which is uh, disappointing. We know that 14 local authorities have long-term solutions in place, and that includes the major authorities uh, like Glasgow, Edinburgh and Dundee, and the other um, authorities have interim solutions in place. Our focus now is trying to work with those authorities who do not have a solution in place to identify ways such as using collaborative uh, procurement and improved recycling to comply with the ban um, as soon as possible. So at the moment, although some of these questions are for the Cabinet Secretary for the Environment, sure. our intention is that that ban, which has been in legislation since 2012, mm. um, would still be uh, our objective. And that was reflected in the Scottish Fiscal Commission's uh, forecasts uh, most recently. But that work with COSLA and with local authority waste management services um, continues to try uh, and address that challenge. But our policy still prioritises waste reduction. Um, and I think that is reflected in the, in the forecasts. Um, in terms of uh, additional taxes, um, or uh, as far as I know, there we we have a constant rolling program of work looking at um, further devolution of taxes and the ways in which we can improve uh, our current tax regime. And again, I think any changes in this area have got to be taken forward in collaboration with the Cabinet Secretary for the Environment, because it's one of those areas where you can achieve multiple policy objectives if you work together quite closely. If you're concerned about waste tourism as a, as a possible threat, then presumably if the UK government did look at a wider disposal tax, yeah. uh, there would be a, a real need for Scotland to have the power to do the same. Absolutely. There were, and again, it's these unintended consequences of only having partial devolution of taxes where we have full devolution over policies around the environment. But if we were hamstrung by not having the tax powers to be able to control waste management, waste tourism, for example, then that would significantly hinder our environmental policies and objectives. Thank you. Um, I don't understand, Minister, what the, 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 this use of being, the language of being hamstrung. I mean, ever since the Kalman Commission um, uh, in Section 80B of the Scotland Act, this Parliament has the power to create new taxes. We, have, we already have the power to create new, if there's a need for a new, we already have the power to create new taxes. And I think the point that I just made there was that there's a rolling, um, fee, rolling work in the Scottish Government looking at how we can improve our current taxes and increase devolution of taxes. The point I was trying to make there is that if you've got two portfolios that are both trying to achieve two very similar objectives, they've got to be working together. And the tax regime has got to reflect the environmental policy objectives. Right, but that, just to be clear, I mean, that isn't about future devolution of powers which the Parliament doesn't yet have. It's about future exercise by the government. It's about of making which sure... Excuse me, of powers Sorry. which this Parliament already has. Yeah, and it's about making sure that we use the powers that we have currently. But to Patrick Harvey's point, if the UK government were to introduce a new tax, for a good example at the moment, I think, is their consideration of a digital services tax. Our priority would be to look at what impact that will have on Scotland and to respond appropriately. Okay, no other further questions. If there are no further questions, we now move to agenda item five, which is consideration of the motion on the order. I invite the Minister to move S5M16045 that the Finance and Constitution Committee recommends that the Scottish landfill tax bracket standard rate and lower rate bracket order 2019 be approved. Um, moved. Members, got any further comments? There have been no further comments, and I put the question. The question is that motion S5M16045 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Um, I thank our witnesses for their contribution to this discussion. We will publish a report to Parliament setting a decision on the order later today. And I now close this meeting of the Financial Constitution Committee.